Hi, my name is James Aladinoglu. I'm going to talk about some of the analysis that we have done using the Spikes project and CCP collection. I wasn't sure what to call this talk, and first I, I had to come up with the title for my idea of course, in a hurry, so I said, okay, like this project, this is analysis data. But if I was to do it again, I would probably call it a side at work because some people were adopting a side of software phenomena. We all, know that we all know that the CGP is not perfect, and there are too many catastrophes, and some of it has been in the press. Often, these are due to misconfiguration. People need each other's trust, and sometimes people inject the full DGP papers in GP and inject the CGP and the left of the internet for a day or so. And sometimes they are there to run the bus, but uh, anyway, and Paul has known convergence problems. Craig and Ava has done an excellent job of documenting some of these. And it has been, I mean, in about to half an hour, if I'm right. And recently people have started questioning the scaling properties of, I should say, internal main routing as opposed to DGC. And people have said that it is exponential or even reverse that it is quite exponential. And we wanted to understand what's happening again so that uh, we can perhaps uh, see what we can do. Okay, why do we need to care about growth? If the growth is small, the linear or cartridge case. Well, uh, we need to add more memory and uh, CPU power to the routers once in a while, but it's not a big deal. And it's exponential, but if it's slower than the Moore's law, we can still call. It's probably very expensive. And if it's faster than the Moore's law, uh, if it's hyper exponential or so, the next generation router that you have to buy and replace in your infrastructure will cost more than what you paid last time, and uh, eventually it, you can keep up. And if that's also the case, you need to have a new DGP in a hurry. You need to, and you may not have enough time to actually come up with the right solution. I mean, it has to be the, the standard solution. Whereas if it is one of the other two, then we have time. We can, I mean, it's, it's too good to come up with something nice, but we have more time. We can actually understand all these things and then perhaps uh, come up with the right solution. Well, for this study, I use data from right this project. I think quite a few speakers before me have mentioned what this is. Uh, I just need to tell that uh, I'm really grateful for them for their efforts for collecting this data and making it available to us. One big difference between using this data versus using uh, snapshots, either from them or from Starfield or other places, is that we can actually study the behavior of the BGP as opposed to a snapshot of the routing table. For example, we can look at the churn, and one other speaker before me has used it to do that, and has shown some great results. And we can also see convergence, we can see how fast it takes to convert routes, and we can see how, my, how often people misconfigure their routes. Actually, there are quite a few things we can do with this data that uh, is hard to measure, or even if you measure, perhaps you underestimate using snapshots. For example, if you use snapshots to measure multi homing, then uh, as another speaker has said, that uh, there are quite a few AS changes that you would miss because you are only looking at snapshots every couple of hours or so forth. Whereas if you use this data, you have every single PDP update and you wouldn't miss anything. The first thing I'm going to show you is the routing table size, but I need to caution you because this is not the routing table size of a single ISP. This is a cumulative routing table size. And during the, during the time frame of this project, uh, or the data collected, there were actually up to 22 different hearings here to, uh, to, this, uh, to this machine and uh, had to send their BG products. And this uh, table size that I'm going to show you is the addition of all of these routing tables. Basically, everyone has some set of prefixes that the other people don't have, and when you have this, they're actually, they're actually coming up to some upper bound on the housing table class size of a single ISP. But the good news is, this year there is basically very slow to no growth at all. But the question is, can the uh, growth rate of the past be surplus, and if they were, how, how were they? How fast were they? Okay, this first graph shows the routing table size, as I defined it, through October, actually September of 1999 to October 10th, like two weeks before the month of meeting. And the red curve is the routing table size, and I smoothed it because there's quite a few ups and downs and 
sometimes uh, uh, the server crashes and users install and so forth. But anyway, I submitted to the site data point. And there are two uh, curves on it. The green one is the moon goal. As you can see, it seems really scary on the first 10 months. It's kind of like following the moon law. And then the blue one is actually the quadratic set, which is also right on there. And the question is, what is it? Is it like exponential or is it quadratic or is it real? What is it? So we zoom into the first 10 months. That, that scary part was. The graph on the left-hand side is shows the, shows the first 10 months with the y-axis being linear scale. And the same uh, data on the right hand side is the logarithmic scale. Quite a few people actually have shown us that a plot of the growth on the logarithmic scale and they have drawn a line and they said yes, it's exponential. Unfortunately, it might be exponential but it might also be other things. Uh, for one, exponentials and for numbers can look alike depending on the coefficients and the constants and the range you pick in the x-axis, I mean, you may have not like x pick the right uh, range of x. And if you had infinite access, maybe you could tell by just plotting it on the log scale, but if you have a data over 10 months or uh, 8 hours or whatever, it's hard to say. That's why by just looking at that, is not sufficient. It's a hint, but uh, not sufficient. The next thing I have done is actually this is 10 months data, and I fit three curves to this. Uh, there is a blue, red, and green uh, lines on it, flowing. It's hard to tell which one is what. Yes, yes. That's actually good, because one of them is a linear set, the other one is a quadratic set, and the third one is an exponential set. They all fit. And uh, the, the R-square numbers that people usually report them, they have fits like this, are up there, and they are all like 10, 99, and some other digits. They are all extremely good. But R-square numbers are not good enough, and you can, you can, there are actually quite a few uh, for analyzing the residues to see which one is a better set. And I use those. There's a package called R and it provides like four or five different tests for telling how good the fit is. And all of these are good fits. And none of them is any better than the other one or no worse than the other one. But there is one property of the exponential that the other two fits don't have in that if you take the difference in the x, y point, and just plus that, basically you would be taking the derivative of this growth. An exponential derivative is still an exponential, whereas the quadratic derivative is a linear and linear derivative is a constant. And this is the plus of the derivative after some smoothing. And the red line that goes through it is the trend line that is using the lowest, uh, lowest fitting. But uh, if it was exponential, you would expect that red lines are an exponential set. And it doesn't happen. Now about CIDR. People also have question how effective the CIDR is because we have multi-homing now and multi-homing open means one more traffic for every multi-home site in your routing table. And the other thing that people have said, there is this inter-domain traffic engineering and then basically what it means, you have a block of addresses, say S-16 or S-19 or whatever, but you want to chop it up into longer or chop it up into components and you want to announce like 24 and depending on what peering connections you have, you announce them different, get different peering, and then you can maybe manage your peering bandwidth much better. You can pull some routes from one IFC and some from the other one. So basically, you have more room to play with, and that's what uh, often people call as inter-domain traffic engineering. And that too means you have to basically, instead of announcing the single address, you have to now announce all bunches of addresses. And people have also blamed the uh, uh, growth in the routing table to that. And both of these actually work against CIDR, because CIDR lets you kind of nice to aggregate things, but if you have these, you have to undo the effect. So to measure how effective the CIDR is, we have, since we have every single update for since September of 1999, we wanted to see how about the prefixes that we no longer see, how, how, how fast they are growing. That is, there was a time that prefix was in the routing table, and it's not anymore. I mean, we have 100,000 routing table entries or so today, and if there were 9,000 two months ago or whatever, then how much of it is actually the same 9,000 routes? So, why would these routes become historic? And there are a couple of reasons for that. One would be obviously CIDR. If people might not have been aggressively CIDRing their routes into uh, aggregates, but maybe they are doing a better job now. The 
Second reason, ISPs often make their more specific. So at some time, that may be like, oh, why don't you go more specific from ISP that you typically don't have in the routing tables, but then they, they later realize it's about a misconfiguration error or whatever, and they uh, take them back. This would also show up in the historic column. And then the third one is the private address space. If anyone was by mistake announced private address space and later they stop, again, my tracking of the telepathy could capture that. And lastly, the unassigned address space that the families used to, uh, to their mail. They would also show up as historic characteristics in this graph. I have actually filtered the private address spaces from this list, and it doesn't make much difference, and it doesn't really change the graph. But I haven't done it for the unassigned address space. And this is how it looks. The red curve below is the routing tables from September to this month, and the green one is the historic. Without fiber, basically you would have both of the tables, and it would be like five times more. The routing table today is sort of 100,000, would take around 600,000. There are all these spikes, and they actually they follow each other. Like this spike and that spike. Uh, basically, uh, in, in this case, we have all the way to zero, the collection machine was done, and in all, all of a sudden, everything becomes historic from my analytic perspective, and then there was no current class. So this kind of cancel each other. But there are also things that match here. Things like someone announcing maybe they're more specific or private addresses or something, and then they first increase the routing table size, and then they later become, uh, they later become historic. But if you add these two, they actually cancel each other and we come up with the total growth. This looks like this. Well, for all practical purposes, this looks like a linear line to me. I mean, you, know, you can fix a curve to this, but I didn't even try. But there is some tapering of here, but uh, that's actually means some slowing. You know, but it's hard to tell, it's just a uh, little data. But you can see the next answer to I did try and that doesn't change. There is no difference at all. wanted to find out whether people are right when they blame multi-homing of traffic engineering for this road. Where is it coming from? And I have classified every single traffic into one of the following categories. For multi-homing, I have two different ways, and as you will discuss this. First, the AS, uh, the multi-home type, gets its own origin AS and does be with its multiple ISPs, and then hence you can see its AS number in the system, and you can also see that it's adjacent to several other ASs. The other way is the multiple origin ISS. People do, I mean, it may not be a best uh, practice, but people do announce uh, legitimately their prefixes with two different AS numbers. I suppose they don't, they don't have to run DPP, and they do not rely on both ISPs to announce it if they are. The second classification is the engineer prefixes. These prefixes basically have components, I mean, there are some sort of prefixes, and they are compo component prefixes, and they have exactly the same, same origin AS. Hence, there is no real reason to not have those compo components other than traffic engineering, and I classified anything which was not multi-home, and it had that property into the engineer prefixes. The third category is the punching holes. These are basically the prefixes like, for example, somebody is flush 15 and somebody, uh, and the uh, most specific is flush 24, but you never see them with the same origin. So, flush 15 may come from AS1 and flush 24 may come from AS2. And never in the whole duration of these two years that you see them with the same origin. That I call punching code. It is actually possible that it was actually multi horn but it was extremely stable that during these two years we have never seen the other announcements. I, 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 I can't tell. I mean, uh, it is possible some person that it might be that, but uh, there is no way for me to do analogy and to, but uh, if internet is not as stable as people say, then uh, it wouldn't have happened. But uh, the other reason that punching holes may happen is, at least in the old days, you take an address block from the ASP and then you change your ASP and you, you, you may have to, you may be able to keep it. Then that would be punching holes. Okay, here is the how the growth looks. 
the one on the top is the regular prefixes, meaning it is not one of the three that specifications that I come up with. It is prefixes that are not marked by home, and they are not perfect engineers, they are not old or anything. And you can see that it is growing. And another thing interesting to observe here is that it kept growing. It could not stop growing. That is, the entire writing table has stopped growing. I mean, it was more or less flat this year, but this has grown even this year. The second one is the multi homing You can see that it was growing and kind of slowed down. There are these uh, chimneys, I should say, in the graph. I'm going to explain that in the next slide. This one is the hole, the punch hole, and this seems to be the actually the first growing component, and now it's actually decreasing. And then this one is the traffic engineer one. It had the steepest slot in slot here, so this was the, for the first some months, it was the piece that actually contributed to the biggest growth. But now it's more or less flat and it's much less than what it used to be. For multi homing, these are the two components of it. This is the basic multi homing with getting your own AS and your own BGP, and this is the with the multiple origin. The chimneys are basically when someone injects a prefix with the AS, it is possible that this is a multi origin AS. It's also possible that this is a configuration error, someone misinjecting injecting routes. So, what I do when I hear an uh, announcement, I first classify it as a multi-home, and if for after two weeks, if I never see that AS number again as the original AS, I say, oh, it's a good mistake, and I correct it, and hence all of these uh, chimneys are two weeks with uh, them. So, basically, uh, I should really filter them out and not bring this line back here, but uh, that's a hard thing. This is a major configuration error. Someone basically injected 30,000 processes that didn't belong to them. And uh, suddenly multi-homing went up and then everything went down, but uh, the real goal is not, uh, you have to really uh, eliminate this in the before you can tell what it is. But what is interesting is that the multi-homing kept growing this year too. It didn't slow down. But it's also interesting that it doesn't look exponential. I mean, uh, For those of you who were at the IETF, uh, so the next set of slides are actually new. And this graph shows for all the prefixes in the x-axis the number of routers that can see that those prefixes. That is, this is the trial, which uh, I think, uh, this, this, like, by the way, these two graphs are based on a snapshot as opposed to the whole three years run. So there is that little caveat. But what it means is at that time there were 12 active BGP sessions. So this point uh, is logical, it's a little bit hard to read, but 80%. So 80% of the prefixes in the routing table, as I defined it, were seen by everybody. The other 20 were, were not seen by somebody, one, at least one other uh, ISP. But this doesn't mean if you take your routing table and take another ISP's routing table that's very close and will be different. This is actually, if you take your routing table and try other ISPs, one of them will miss 20%. I mean, for 20% of the routes, there will be one who would miss it. And this is actually 3%, which means 3% of the prefixes in this combined rural ISP routing table only were known to a single ISP. I think these two points are the most interesting. Ones. And this is how it looks in the cumulative distribution. Uh, it's not important, but I want to kind of plot this so that it could be a prelude to my next slide where I do the same thing for all of these categories that I mentioned earlier. This shows actually how the filtering works. So these are the regular routes, and you can see that, uh, actually this is, this is log scale, so this is like the 1,000 or 0.1%. Uh, 0.1% you know. this is like 0.2% uh, of what you say, it's near this second thing. Anyway, but what this graph tells you that the more you fiddle with the route, that there is a traffic engineer, in which case 10% of the traffic engineer's routes were only seen by one ISP. Or for multi homing, it's about 1%, and for regular, it's actually 0.1%. So the more you fiddle with the route, the more people filter it out. And this is consistent with the 
and it is consistent with the uh, policies, like for example, where you filter the components and such, and, uh, and some of the multi homing would be filtered based on that, or the engineer's refugee would be filtered based on that too. The next natural step was to look at the S number growth, and uh, we were also told that was exponentially growing, and uh, we have an ITF had some responsibility to make sure that we could grow it beyond the 6 byte founder, I mean 2 byte founder, and 4 bytes. But the thing is, if the S numbers are growing exponentially, and each AS had single traffic, because the, the, the whole point is to make them outside home, if each AS had a single traffic, then the, you would expect the DVD routing table to grow exponentially also. So that made me question this, and I put the graphic down. And this is how the AS numbers are growing, and it looks more or less aligned, but if you actually were to share an exponential and a linear and a quadratic or whatever, the exponential first of all doesn't share. Doesn't I mean, for all the pairs, it just looks, looks non stationary But quadratic actually fits better than the linear, and this was also found by uh, and this is the total AS number growth, and this one is the multi-home AS, that is AS which has more than one efficiency in the system. And these are the transit AS, that is, I suppose, AS And this is everybody else, the people who has origin AS, they have their own prefixes, but as far as I can tell, they're only connected to one other AS. And Again, we can see the same observation. You know, there is no flow down here. So, if multi-homing was the reason for the, that fast growth in DGT, you would have seen that growth keep going. You, you wouldn't have seen it to slow down, so it was not there. The other thing that you can look at with using the right data is the term. And we all know that, uh, thanks to Abba and Craig, we all know that uh, during the DGT converges, it can actually apply a factorial number of paths, factorial in terms of the diameter of the network. And if the tables are growing and the turn can be uh, doing convergence factorial, the turn actually may be growing even faster. So I was a little bit uh, surprised that uh, it wasn't so bad anyway. So I looked at the turn at each each route separately, instead of like the turn of the server that it has to do with the other ISPs, but I looked at the turn coming from every single ISP individually. It was extremely noisy. I mean, there are hours that are hard to understand, there are hours which is like common like this more turn. So what I have done to smooth that, I actually did quite a few, but I only need to show you for the case, that for every single day, I took the median hours, the turn of the me median Turn of the median turn over the 24 hours of the day, and I took that to represent that day. And then since I have twelve routers, I took the median router to represent the turn of an average router in the internet. And those are the graphs I'm going to show, but I did look at the minimum, maximum, and averages, and it's not, they are not telling anything new actually. The good news is this is the overall churn and this is decreasing. I and mean, this is in low scale and you can slightly see it. And uh, this, is, this is actually very good news. I mean, basically, I suppose the routers are shipping better for than that they used to. And people are making less configuration mistakes and the connections are up better. But it shows that the churn is, the DGT churn is decreasing. And this is in low scale actually, this is uh, quite a bit decreasing. If you actually take the credit graph but divide it by the number of prefixes in the table so at each point, and before instead of putting the term, you put the term divided by the number of prefixes at that time, this is per prefix term. That is, how often a single prefix church in terms an hour. And it looks like, I mean, if, if you take this point, it would be like every 10 hours it turns one. Every 10 hours the prefix, uh, there's a something uh, happening about that term. But you can actually see the decrease much better here. So the stability of a single traffic is increasing very nicely. But there is one exception to these observations. I have actually looked at the turn for each of the categories that I have described earlier, 
but only one of them actually has something interesting. These are the engineer prefixes. While everyone else's churn is decreasing, engineer prefixes churn actually slightly increased. Except maybe two years where their number actually went down. So this they, they shows different and uh, I wonder why this is happening. I suppose people prefix engineer them so that they can do things different at different hearing points and I don't know whether if any of them are doing this dynamic way or maybe they are fiddling with them more often they are reconfiguring them or something that actually they actually cause more uh, more churn. And this is the stick. This actually I was wondering if this is the same stick as the one that the very speaker showed around July 18, but it turns out to be this actually ended actually on July 1st. I don't know what happened prior to July 1st. I wanted to show the churn curve prefix length. Uh, however, the graph gets really noisy, and I need to explain the smooth of them in the interesting things loser. So instead, I decided to show the 8, 24, and the 16. This is the 8. And this is per prefix, that is, it is weighted to the number of prefixes in the system. And, I, uh, and there are extremely few plus 8 in the Latin table. And, for example, 24 are have less churn than the eight per prefix phases, and that's because there are good 24s and that's that per 24s, and then they kind of average each other out. Whereas the eight actually seems to have churned a lot more than the 24s, and blue is the 24, by the way, you can see. And uh, so that's why the eight churn more. Also, another reason, eight are not them is exactly as 24s are, and hence that this is the churn of the 24s. Every other prefix length, between 16 and 24, is between these two curves. But uh, it's hard to say, but basically the 24 by comparison to 16 are turning 50% more per hour. Uh, again, this is per traffic, that is basic. If you actually look at the absolute number of turns that 24 are bringing into the system, that, that is uh, way too much bigger than anything else in the system, because there are 6,024. 6, I wanted to understand why the term was, where was it coming from, and I looked at the graph and, uh, anyway, to make it for the short, short, I have realized that the major chance of the term is basically losing and re-establishing DGP peering. Because when you lose a DGP peering, you have to withdraw all of your routes that uh, have to do with that peering. And then later, you, when you re-establish, you have to announce them again. If you are getting full writing table piece like this server is, that means each time you lose it and re-establish it, you are having two times the routing table, which is 200,000 turns injected into the system. Whereas, if it's appearing, appearing between two ISPs, uh, they are extending like a thousand routes or so, then it's in two thousand. And here is how. And this graph shows the turn of a single router, the red one, and this is like the more or less its steady state turn. And then there are these uh, spikes, which are, I don't know how many orders of multitude figure, but they will be 200,000, 200,000, And these, all these uh, green uh, diamonds are when the Hearing was re-established, it was lost and was re-established. The point of this slide is not that it's actually a lot. I, I actually picked the worst route to show it's attack obviously. But it's not, I'm not showing that how many times it happens. I'm showing that each time it happens, that's the attack. It's actually 200,000, like 100,000 withdrawals and 100,000 or whatever the size of the start table at that time is, withdrawal. So this router, that, this is actually a data over a month, actually soon of this year, there were about 16 million DGP operations done caused by this here. And out of the 16 million, 12 million was this. But what is worse, actually this churn is carried away multiple hot parades. There is another router, for the same month, it's, there's actually very few places, very, it's kind of hard to see. And so this is the only graph which is, I think, is under one before, the only graph which are TNG, 
uh, and substitute, but there is one which appears, and then there is another one here, maybe there is another one, but I can't see, see myself. But, other than the value the information was, uh, which you hearing was reset and re-established, there are other things. And what's happening here is actually this particular router was the right entity's own router, which was in the ISP, but they actually had master homing and they actually had to uh, come into them and then setting the server also. What happens is if that router, not the server, if that router was to lose its hearing to one of those, that there, there would be 200,000 turn there, and based on how many of those processes are called, they would have carried that turn another hub for the collection machine. And depending on how fast the BCP hearing was lost and re-established, you get less and less turn, but they are even the smallest spikes here are all based on somewhere, probably a couple of half uh, losing and re-establishing the BCP hearing. So, the dominant thing in the churn is, uh, is basically uh, is basically losing uh, the GDP churn. Uh, another thing that uh, I think not no surprise to anybody is that if you look at the churn across routers, it's very varying. Sometimes one router for more than uh, so many months there's like a couple of other more magnitude churn than the other one. Uh, but, uh, so fast. Okay, in summary, uh, I believe there is more evidence that the growth has been quadruplet in the past. I mean, today there is absolute, uh, and there is very slow growth or no growth, but when it was growing, I think there is more evidence that it's been quadruplet than exponential. And if you were to blame the growth on multi homing, if you just look at the multi-homing growth, it starts the S numbers and the traffic to the child multi-home, there is no evidence of an exponential there. I mean, in first, it wouldn't be exponential. Second, since the multi-homing is still keep on growing, the growth wouldn't have stopped. For churn, the overall churn is decreasing. That's very good. And for, to improve the churn further, we need to first improve the, the hearing loss and re-establishment. And that may mean we either make it more robust, that is, the router renders give us code that doesn't, that tries to keep the appearance alive as much as possible, or if it has to happen, we have a different mechanism to avoid that exception. I, I said the engine traffic should turn more, I said this particular group here, even though they turn more, and uh, they are, uh, their turn seems to be increasing. This is not the dominating type of thing. The dominating thing is uh, this is actually so many more uh, orders of magnitude more than the endemic picture. In conclusion, in the short term, to, we need to increase the router stability and to take the turn in control, we need to try to remove the spikes in the turn. And one thing that I haven't shown in this slide, but you can actually, if you just look at the uh, the historic and the current static growth, and if you zoom in to like a, about a week growth of data, you will see like a little spike going up and down. Those are all configuration mistakes. Someone announced to somebody else's traffic and so forth. And we need to make the routers more robust. And I don't know what this means, whether it means zero knobs or more robust knobs or whatever, but uh, we need to make the configuration of these boxes simpler. And it's not just the ISPs. I mean, we had to configure, we did some master home uh, last Friday and we had to make another system. But we had to configure it and meanwhile our router crashed on us four times. And, but anyway, it needs to be simpler as well. In the longer term, this is kind of like a warning. The plans can change. Even though I told you that the growth in the past has been quadratic, it may change. It may become exponential. This is just the analysis of the past. It doesn't say what's going to happen in the future. I can't predict that. If I would, I would say again, I think okay. And also, remember that the growth is good. I mean, if you don't have growth in your system, then you don't have new customers, and you don't have new demand coming, and you need to grow. It's just that we need to, either it has to be controlled, or we need to make the system so that it's controlled. Okay. Thank you.
a few questions that came in over the um, uh, archive. And um, I don't know, let's see, how can I handle this? Um, Bill, um, I don't know. Can I don't know if it's worth getting all the speakers up here first because we don't have a lot of time, right? Okay. Lisa, yeah. Lisa, Bill, are you still in here? Okay. Um, Bill, we'll go. I'll try to get his question. Okay, so, as, uh, Avi asked this following question. Given that people use more specifics to change traffic so that quality will be better, is it actually of interest in economic value to hear and honor more specifics? Which, which is really general, which is really in general. Why is there a little discussion about performance and hearing and routing discussion? I wish he was here so I could clarify that a little bit. Um, I don't answer that because I don't really know the answer to that. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. So. I think I'll leave. Uh, and what is going on, huh? Would you like me to clarify that for you? Yeah, go ahead. Take the best shot. Well, specifically, we're wondering why, if people are announcing more specifics intentionally to do traffic engineering and other topics, if they have uh, better feeds for one location than another, why are you intentionally not listening to more specifics and thereby ignoring the people who probably have the very best idea which way is best to reach these IPs? The entire talk about filtering and what's good for uh, these kind of things completely ignores all performance gains. Every time Randy gets up there, he talks about this is reachable or not reachable. He never talks about when it changes from one to the other. Um, yeah, I understand the question. I still don't want to answer it. You want, you want, you want me to try to shot at answering it? Uh, well, yeah, go ahead. Just everybody realize that whatever answer it is has to do with your point of view. Right? Yeah, that's true. Um, let's see. The number of prefixes that you throw away and still have no reachability to, according to Randy figures, is very, very small. Right? It's like you know, half a percent, one, you know, one percent, something like that. Um, so Randy's theory is, is that if you throw away all those prefixes, you're not actually losing your reachability to these people. Um, uh, no, yeah, I, I know. I'm, I'm, let me get to that. So you aren't actually getting. The theory is, if you're if you're far enough away from these people, you know, you pass it to them. It's gonna if you throw away the prefix. If you don't throw away the prefix, you're still gonna a reach them and b take the same path from you to the next top, closer to them, right? And it's only close to them where it matters as to which way you get in, right? So if if, if you're back far enough away from them. The extra information in the rounding table makes zero difference to you as to what your next rounding hop is going to be, so it doesn't matter if it's there or not. Right? So that, that's the theory. Now, it's unclear, it's, it's hard to figure out how to measure that, right? Depends on the, it, so, it depends on the AS connectivity, how the AS connectivity grows right. um, it, as a function of the radius around you. Well, first of all, there's zero data on whether or not being farther away makes a difference. So it's a nice assumption, but we have nothing to prove that. Second of all, most big backbones talk to each other, and most small backbones or small providers have connections to big backbones. So what this really is, is it's Quest trying to decide to go through UUNet or Sprint, because there's a young, a small customer that has a connection to UUNet and a connection to Sprint. He's using a UUNet aggregated cider. He's announcing the uh, more specific through both. He thinks his quest connectivity is better or it's less congested or it's bigger. He's got an OC3 to one, a DS3 to the other, etc., etc. And you have thrown that information away. I would argue that the information is actually useful. And they, since we have zero data on it, all we've done is gone, oh, there's 0.7% of the prefixes which are completely unreachable. And we've never even looked at the fact that there is possible performance gain. Maybe there isn't. But you know what? Nobody's ever even looked at it. I'm, I'm going to answer this question two different ways. What? The first one is to amplify what Andrew just said, is that the speculation and the theory is that if you're far enough away to not care about the traffic engineering benefit, the performance really isn't going to change by throwing away those prefixes. But the basic problem is that you know, your local optimization in doing these 
these uh, traffic engineering tricks is the internet as a whole global pessimization. Um, I mean, it's a tragedy of the commons thing. You can't continue to do little tiny local optimizations that have global visibility and are causing global scaling problems. It just doesn't work. Except every single network on the planet, except KPN and Vario that I've ever seen, seems to be able to scale it just fine. UNET, Sprint, everybody else does exactly this thing. The only people that don't are Vario and KPN that I've seen, and I've tested, I don't know, 14, 15 different networks. I posted it to Nanos. Nobody ever showed me anybody that isn't. UNET has never once complained about the scaling properties, neither has anybody else recently, except Vario, uh, except Randy who isn't actually running a network anymore. Cool. Well, speaking of Randy, um, <laughs> I, I don't think uh, that the issue is whether things are failing today. I don't think, uh, I don't think that the issue is whether we can make a scale in the next six months. I think that the issue is whether we have policy that is right now being expected to be accepted by people who have no financial incentive to do so, right? It, it's not a question of whether whether the current generation of routers will fall over tomorrow. The question is, is there a path by which money can flow from the people who are creating the load to the people who are solving the problem, that is, building the boxes? And right, I mean, there, there's cost, right? If we want boxes that will accommodate this in the future, they have to be paid for. Right? It, Money started as well. That wasn't the question. <laughs> the question is, do we have any data that shows anything about performance on this? And the answer is, to my knowledge, zero data. Do we know what performance difference is going to take? Do we know how many packets, how many megabits a second, how many path changes are made by this filtering? And I haven't seen any data on it. If you have data, cool. If you want to uh, present it, I'd love it. If you want to show us why you know, UUNet is not targeting their customers properly, that's a different question. Well, actually, okay, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not answering your current question directly, but let me try to answer the question you basically just asked your previously. Okay. You basically say that the large carriers have not uh, basically uh, present the case of this scalability or this issue. Actually, that's not true at all. As the rather vendor, I can assure you that uh, the largest carriers, this actually the setting and the commodity issue, it's, it's, a, it's every issue that we have basically uh, explained to the rather way. For example, some of the largest ICs are carrying like a a quarter million predictions in a rush. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it takes like uh, 30 minutes or 40 minutes to convert. So it's, uh, it's, it is a big problem today. And uh, we basically have been pushed very hard to address these issues. I repeat, do we have any data on this? Would and somebody the, like to present something? Okay, there? maybe this is something we should, we, we should encourage our, our friends in the research community to look at. Yeah. I mean, we're I'm not going to go. We're not going to be able to get any further than that. I, I completely understand. I just want to make sure everybody realizes that what I'm not asking for is um, anecdotal stuff about somebody going. Somebody else told me that it takes this long. The presentations that we have here all have data on them. They have graphs. They have nice things that show us what's going on. Bill, we can't hear what you're saying. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm from friend from your research community. Uh, so we'll respond and do some measurements. But I think there is some very, very, very indirect data, however, to support um, Randy or slash various position, which is, you know, just generally speaking, the dynamics goes up with uh, the number of routing entries, period. Okay, let's let's move on. The, the next, the other two that we have are uh, on the, on the MAOS work. Um, someone says um, Larry Blunk from Merit says, "I would like to ask Alicia why she did not mention the use of the routing registries to just to address the issue of I mean, the the complex. Does she believe there are intrinsic problems with this approach?" Uh, 
I hope somebody else can answer from you. So, well, what's the question? The question is, say, why we wouldn't check with registry? Yeah, do you have a problem with using the uh, IRS? Uh, well, no, yeah, you can check. I didn't think, I didn't rule out that as a solution. I was thinking of choosing the inline solution uh, to go with DGP. So the team came up with the idea. I think, you know, you could replace or in addition to the BGP checking, you can do that registry checking as well, if that's trustworthy. Uh, here's, a, here's another one on the same topic. Um, this is from Vince. If one of the goals of this exercise is to prevent malicious route insert and delete, how will, it, how will the community solution be effective? Someone who can insert bogus routes via BGP can presumably also attach the appropriate community. The real solution is ubiquitous filtering well routes at the point they are advertising the BGP. Um, I thought that made the example to show that uh, that you know unlike the attackers can really block the propagation of the correct attributes. Um, otherwise, you know as long as, soon, as long as the correct attributes can get out, then the third party, the false party, can see the inconsistency, the the hack community is and the correct community. So it's the, the intrinsic nature of distributed topology and now it's good. Vince, are you okay? So he's gone around, so I don't know if that reached reached his threshold for what he was looking at there. Well I thought we I thought we I think that's all the questions we had. Really? Yeah, thank you. What happens to the, this is for you again, Alicia. What happens to your community during when routes are de-aggregated, or when they're aggregated or de-aggregated? Um, unless someone wants to come here and answer that question, I haven't thought. Uh, so, so basically, what we were looking at is these routes that originated from from two different origins. Now, if you're going to take those and you're going to aggregate them together, uh, I think at that point um, we we don't really have a uh, we don't have a good we don't have a good answer for that at this point. But I think this is this is something that you could handle at the aggregation point if you're interested in in attaching the attributes there or uh, or simply turn the, the attributes through, but we'd, we'd be interested in discussing that more with somebody offline. Um, so that that um, that question came from Sharis Krishnan and Erickson. All right. So now I think we don't have any more questions. Okay. Well, I I first want to thank all the um, all the speakers. That was a great session, and everybody. Um, I think that's good as well, so thank you.